This is my entire home lab, and in this video, we're gonna go through it from start to finish. Welcome to my entire home lab laid bare. It's been a minute since we did a home lab update, but more than that, our previous what's running in our home lab videos have been pretty high level and not very detailed. This video aims to solve that. Hey there, home labbers and cell posters. Rich here, buckle up because in this video, we are going deep into my entire home lab from the top to the bottom, from the physical hardware to the physical network topology and configuration, and down to the individual VMs and containers I'm running. Hopefully this gives you some new ideas and inspires you, but also remember that running a home lab and self-hosting is what you make of it. Let's start by talking about my physical hardware. This is my entire home lab. Everything is housed in a standard 42U server cabinet made by APC that I picked up a long time ago. Let's go through every piece of gear I have, starting from the top. On top of my rack is my Ubiquiti Unify USW Pro Aggregation Switch. Logically, I use this guy as my core aggregation switch for my home lab, where all of my high-speed network connections from servers, storage, and core routing terminate. It has 28 ports of 10 gig SFP Plus connections and four ports of 25 gig SFP 28 connections. Someday, I hope to use those 25 gig connections for the servers and storage, but the cost of SFP 28 NICs are still too high, and the fact that I'm not fully saturating my 10 gig connections anyway means I don't have a reason to use them, but they're nice to have there in the future. Next is a brush pass through for the mess of SFP Plus Twin Axe DACs and fiber that I have connecting up to the ProAg switch. I wish there was a pretty way to manage the Twin Axe cable mess, but eh, it's a home lab. Moving on. Next is my Frankincense box I built a while back. I absolutely love this system. It originally started its life as a Sophos SG330 firewall running Sophos. I acquired it off eBay, dumped Sophos, and installed PFSense Plus on it. I also upgraded it to a faster CPU, and it's been the best little purpose-built firewall ever. I even got the LCD display working on it using a package already available in PFSense. The really nice thing about this unit is its form factor. With a ton of 1 gig base T connections and dual 10 gig SFP plus cages, it's got all of the connectivity I need, all facing forward, and the fact that it's just a purpose-built PC in a box makes it a no-hassle system to manage. We made a video on building it, check the description for a link if you're interested. Next is my Ubiquiti USW Enterprise 24 PoE switch. This functions as my top of rack switch, and it's where anything that's either 1 gig or 2.5 gig ethernet connects. The USW Enterprise is the most recent addition to my home lab. It's also a great switch, with 12 ports of 1 gig ethernet and 12 ports of 2.5 gig ethernet, all with PoE and two 10 gig SFP plus ports for uplinking to my core. There are things I love and things I don't love about this switch. I really dig the single row of connections, which makes patching look really clean, and it's a really solid switch. I don't love that the thing was nearly $800 retail though. I could have easily gone with a more affordable PoE switch that had enough ports and 2.5 gig. I know my wife would have appreciated it if I did. All of those connections from the 24 port switch are patched into a modular keystone patch panel below. And the colors of the cables have specific meanings. Blue for standard internal network connections, orange for the cameras, and red for the internet connection. Moving on to my favorite stuff, let's talk about the servers. First on the list is my storage system that I've lovingly named SuperSAN. SuperSAN is my primary storage server that serves up my storage for my VMs, Two Guys Tech video data, storage node, and more, and it's proudly running TrueNAS scale. This 12-bay Supermicro chassis has dual E5 2680v4 CPUs running at 2.4 GHz with a total of 28 cores, 56 threads, and currently has 256 GB of RAM. Internal storage in the host is broken into two separate ZFS pools. The first pool is named SSAN T1 P1 R1 iSCSI, and it's a RAID Z1 pool of six 1TB NVMe disks, which combine to create a grand total of 4.2TB of available storage. Its sole purpose is to hold my virtual machines running in ESXi, which we'll talk about later. The next pool is named SSAN T4 P4 R1 NFS, and its disk layout consists of two RAID Z1 data VDEVs, each with six 14 terabyte mechanical disks within. On top of the two data VDEVs, I also have a 500 gigabyte NVMe cache VDEV assigned as well, mostly because I had a spare one lying around. Grand total volume size of the pool is just a shade under 122 terabytes in size. This giant pool of disks is my large data storage pool for Two Guys Tech video data, Plex data, and the home of my storage node data and other miscellaneous data. 
The CPU hardware in this host is overkill for a primary storage array, and that's because it started its life as a single ESXi host and not a storage server. Once I'd moved to an ESXi cluster, it evolved into a dedicated NAS and SAN for storage duties. I wanted to take a moment and touch on my naming scheme for storage pools, something that I learned a long time ago in my years of data center work, and it's a useful thing that you can adopt for your own array. Each part of the pool name has a specific meaning that translates into its capabilities, performance, and functionality. The first pool's name is SSAN T1 P1 R1 iSCSI. Let's break that down. The first section, SSAN, is an abbreviation of the host's name. The next section, T1, stands for Tier 1. Typically, Tier 1 is the highest end tier and is meant for VMs and other systems that require high IOPS performance. Next is P1, meaning Performance 1, or the highest performing disks, which is fitting because the disks used in this pool are NVMEs. The next indicator, R1, describes the disk redundancy used in the pool. R1, in this case, denotes I can sustain a single disk failure. And lastly, iSCSI describes how the pool is made available. In this case, the pool is only available as an iSCSI mount because it's used solely for VM storage on the two ESXi hosts in my cluster. We also made a video about building out SuperSAN, and we'll put a link in the description to that one as well. Moving on. This 2U host in the middle is currently offline and doesn't have a job to do. In an effort to save power, I consolidated storage functionality into SuperSAN and powered down this host. Eventually, I'll unrack it and find it a good home. All right, the next stop is my ESXi cluster. This 2U chassis here actually has two independent servers inside of it, providing me double the density and sharing just two PSUs between them. These two server nodes make up my VMware ESXi cluster and run all of my VMs in my home lab. Each node has dual E5 2680 V4 CPUs, just like the ones in SuperSAN, and each node has 128 gigabytes of RAM in it. One thing to note, even though there are 12 3.5 inch disk bays up front for storage, six split to one node and six split to the other, they're entirely empty because my cluster storage is provided by SuperSAN above using iSCSI. This way my VMs can migrate between nodes in the cluster for redundancy and fault tolerance. This chassis is pretty cool. Two servers, one chassis. I think there's a joke in there somewhere. Anyway, there's no big benefit to having two nodes in one box if you have plenty of rack space, but it does cut down on the amount of power supplies in use in my rack, and I think that it's neat to have both in a single frame like that. Of course, there's a video about this one as well, and you guessed it, I'll leave a link in the description if you want to check out that build. Moving on, we have my DS3622XS Plus Synology NAS. This system has a total of 11 8TB Seagate IronWolf drives and a single 500GB Samsung SSD for caching for a total of 49.6TB of storage space. I have a complicated relationship with Synology products, mostly because of the decisions the company has been making in terms of their verified drives, but there is no denying that Synology does one thing incredibly well, and that's backup. The DS3622XS Plus's whole job is to run backups, and Synology has, in my opinion, one of the best backup software solutions on the market today, and that's Active Backup for Business. I could gush forever about this backup platform. I use it to back up my virtual machines, my home computers, and even the Two Guys Tech Google Workspace stuff. It's got all the features you'd want or need to back up everything, and it's entirely free, assuming you buy a Synology NAS, of course. Mixed feelings aside, Active Backup for Business is legit good, like enterprise-grade good, and there's no limitations to use it, save for the limitation of having to have your own x86 Synology NAS to use it. The final thing I'll add to this is, if you own a Synology NAS that runs Active Backup Business, you should be using it. Moving on. John just a few things left. Below the Synology, I have an older Dell R730 XD, which is here for testing and learning stuff like Proxmox, XCPNG, and whatnot. It's a dual socket E5 2600 V3 something, so it's nearly the same performance as the hosts above. Funny story, 2GT Brandon actually owned this server and acquired it from his previous job where he managed it. I actually purchased this exact server for that company back in the day before I left that same company. Years later, when it was retired from service, he saved it and eventually it came back home to me. Hello, old friend. The rest of the cabin is blanked off to keep airflow going front to back and to make it look clean. When we get server hardware from vendors to review, we remove the panels and mount the gear to test and do B-roll. And lastly, all the way at the bottom is my APC 2200RM UPS missing its faceplate in this photo. There really isn't much to say about this UPS other than it's a little workhorse that has served me well for years, and even with all the gear I have running, it keeps the power smooth and stable for up to an hour of runtime if the lights go out. That was a lot so far, and I hope I haven't lost you yet. I think the next step for us is to talk about my physical and logical network configuration before 
hopping into what I'm running. That way, when I say something like, this VM is running in the DMZ, you'll know where that's at, what restrictions are applied to it, and how it's accessed. Buckle up, here we go. This is the physical topology of my home network, of which 99% of it is made up of Ubiquiti hardware, which I've been collecting over the years. Let's start at the top and work our way down. On top is the Frankincense firewall, which serves two roles in my home lab. First, it's the edge of the network and protects everything else behind it from the bad guys. I'm a big fan of PFSense, and combining that with PFBlockerNG for DNS blacklisting and GOIP blocking is a solid way of controlling who gets to what. OpenSense does a great job of that too, so if you're using that, you're good to go. Next is the Unify Pro Ag switch I mentioned earlier, which serves as the core aggregation for my network. The ProAg connects down to the Unify Enterprise 24 port PoE top of rack switch below via an LACP trunk of 2 by 10 gig twin axe cables. One more thing to add about my core switch config, I have specifically made that switch the spanning tree root for my network, and all of my other descendant switches report up to it for SDP. Everything else after that is distributed through my home. On the left, I have a breakout of Unify switches and APs that serve different areas of the house. In the middle are Unify switches that extend into my studio where I'm filming this right now. And on the far right, I have a simple Unify PoE 5 port switch, which is used in my garage for my 3D printer, garage PC, and so on. It's a pretty simple network design. I've been collecting different Ubiquiti switches and APs for a while now. I like Unify for two primary reasons. One, it's affordable. Even the crazy expensive enterprise switches are attainable for mere mortals like myself. And two, I like the self-hosted controller and management system. It's exceedingly rare to find solid gear that offers a free on-premise controller for management. I wouldn't personally use them in an enterprise, but for home and small to medium business, it is fantastic. All right. Now that we've got our physical topology out of the way, let's look at the logical layer 2 and layer 3 design. You may remember seeing this diagram from the video I did on installing home security cameras, and thankfully it's still valid in terms of my network. My home lab and home network as a whole is effectively broken into five different security zones, all of which are contained within layer 2 VLANs with the Frankincense PFSense firewall acting as the core router. This approach is typically called a router on a stick, since the firewall router is at the end of the connection and no inter-VLAN routing is happening in the switches. All of that is a more complicated way of saying that my PFSense firewall routes data between subnets. Starting at the top is my home LAN VLAN, which is where all my desktops, laptops, mobile devices, and TVs exist. Following the connections, you'll see that there are arrows on both ends of the connection because this VLAN has bi-directional access to the whole network. The next VLAN is the ServerNet VLAN, which is where all of my physical hosts as well as the VMs and container services live. This VLAN also has bi-directional access to the rest of the network. Now on to the DMZ VLAN. The DMZ VLAN holds services that are at a higher risk because they are serving things to the internet. That VLAN can get out to the internet but cannot get to any other VLANs. This way, if a system is compromised, the attackers can't access the rest of my network. Next is the IoT VLAN which, as you may have guessed, holds all of my many IoT devices that we all typically have in our networks these days. This VLAN can access the internet, but it can't directly access any other VLANs in my network, again protecting the important personal systems in case of compromise. Lastly, you see at the bottom the CameraNet VLAN. This VLAN only holds my IP PoE cameras and does not have access to the internet or anything else for that matter. The big NVR icon spans both the IoT VLAN and the CameraNet VLAN so that the network video recorder can record the video from the cameras and make it available via the IoT VLAN. The reason why I run a router on a stick network design is to enforce security zones on different VLANs. Firewalls are the best way to control access between networks, and while you can use ACLs or access control lists on layer 3 switches to control data flow, it's generally considered bad network designed to do so because a layer 3 switch's inner VLAN routing really isn't meant to be filtering packets, just pushing them between VLANs. All right, we've managed to get this far. You know my physical hardware, physical network topology, and my logical network topology. Now let's get into what I'm running in my home lab. Let's start with an overview. I created this diagram to help visualize all the different VMs, containers, and services I self-host in my home lab and give you a visual representation of how they're hosted. The orange bubble represents physical hardware boundaries. The large bubble in the top represents my ESXi cluster, and the two smaller bubbles below represent my scale storage system and my Frankincense PFSense firewall, all of which provide services to various degrees. Let's dig in. I run Plex in a virtual machine that's based on Ubuntu server. Also installed on that VM are the typical R's like Sonar, LiDAR, Radar, and Prowler for media management and control. 
I have been asked a million times why I don't run Plex in a container, and my answer is simple. With the VM, I can scale up and down dedicated resources for Plex like CPU and memory as needed, pass through a piece of hardware easily, and control resource prioritization easily. Yes, I know you can do all this in containers as well, but I prefer a VM. Being a VM also simplifies the NFS share to the media that resides on my storage array. I used to run the Rs in containers, but found that their overall performance to be slower than running with Plex on the VM itself and moved them back to physical installs. Next is my Windows Server 2019 VM. That's right, haters, I run a Windows 2019 server as an Active Directory domain controller. What you gonna do about it? There are a few reasons why I run a Windows Server. The first one is for single sign-on for all the various things running at home. All the personal computers used in my home by my family are Windows-based. Having an ADS server running means I can control and manage all the user accounts used by the family, apply security and group policies, and I can provide internal SSO for things like vCenter and my Synology. And then there's the educational factor. I run a Windows Server so I can test and keep my ADS and Windows Server skills sharp professionally. The next VM is one of my newest additions, a purpose-built Ubuntu Linux VM running only Apache, WordPress, and a Cloudflare tunnel for the Two Guys Tech website. This VM exists in my DMZ VLAN and doesn't directly serve web through the firewall. Instead, I utilize a dedicated Cloudflare tunnel to make the website available through Cloudflare. This provides me extra protections against the bad guys on the net, and with the VM being in my DMZ, if it gets compromised, the worst they could do is gain control of the box and not get to anything else on my network. If I'm being honest though, I really don't enjoy running a WordPress website, but I'm not a developer and I don't have the time to build something from scratch. WordPress is a good CMS, provided you keep it up to date, and self-hosting it saves me like 15 bucks a month in cloud hosting fees. Nextcloud is next. I run a full Ubuntu server that serves as a dedicated Nextcloud server for data sharing between myself, John, and Brandon. The actual data is hosted as an NFS mount on the Linux VM itself, and I do make it available through the firewall because of the sheer amount of data that is synchronized between clients. This VM also lives in the DMZ. I love Nextcloud. It has been such an incredible useful tool for sharing data back and forth between all of us. I use it for 2GT, and I use it personally as my private cloud for file sharing and storage. I've been a long time user of Nextcloud and before that own cloud. I love that I completely control my data, where it's stored, and how it's synchronized between clients. I'm not against using Dropbox or OneDrive, but having complete end-to-end -end ownership of my personal data is seriously fantastic. If you're self-hosting, you should consider running it as well. Also, while you can run Nextcloud in a container, originally the recommendation from Nextcloud itself was to run it in a full VM and not containerize it. I understand that there's been some changes there, so I might consider migrating in the future. Ah, uh, yes. Next is my monitoring VM. This Ubuntu VM runs Telegraph, InfluxDB, and Grafana, as well as Prometheus. This VM is the watcher watching my infrastructure. Structure. I use Grafana to visualize all aspects of my home lab, from the utilization of my firewall, my ESXi cluster, TrueNAS, all the way down to Plex. Data is beautiful and pretty dashboards are super cool. Getting a TIG stack, TIG stands for Telegraph, InfluxDB, and Grafana set up and working is easy. Getting it collecting all of your data is a pain in the butt. But if you're the kind of person who loves visualizing data, tracking your system's performance, and predicting future growth, you gotta get it set up. Next is my Ubiquiti Unify Controller VM, also, as you guessed it, running on Ubuntu Server. Since my entire network is Unify, it stands that I'd need a Unify controller to manage all of my gear. Interestingly, because of my connectivity to John's place, my Unify controller acts as his controller for his gear as well, all completely separated from my gear and clients via the tenant functionality in Unify. Pretty cool. I know I could also run the Unify controller as a container, but it started as a VM and it's stayed a VM ever since. Ubiquiti's gear has been really great and having the controller self-hosted and not in the cloud has allowed me to save money and easily manage my port profile files, VLANs, and everything without ever having to spend any time on a Switch's command line. So far, you've seen most of my network is comprised of purpose-built VMs running specific software or groups of software, but I do leverage containers as well. My container VM, also based on Ubuntu, runs straight Docker and hosts a variety of different containers. To make life easier, I use Portainer as my default GUI management system for the containers running within Docker. On to my containers, starting with PyHole to filter my kids' DNS traffic, Dozzle for container logging, Tautuli for Plex monitoring and metrics, Transmission for Linux ISOs, NetData for its really nice real-time monitoring, a container of Homebridge, which is currently broken, Draw.io, which is what I'm using to make all the pretty pictures for these diagrams, a variety of different game servers to play with my kids like Minecraft, Rust, and Unturned, and lastly, Heimdall as a centralized one-stop shop for all the necessary sites I want or need to get to. 
And the last VM worth mentioning here is my vCenter server for managing my ESXi cluster. VMware vCenter is the centralized management system for VMware ESXi and is the powerful secret sauce that allows you to easily manage your ESXi virtual hosts, manage automated migrations of your VMs, fault tolerance, high availability, updating, and a lot more. I've talked about this so many times in the past, but if you're interested in vCenter, ESXi, or VMware in general, I highly recommend you consider getting a vMug Advantage membership, which is $200 a year. With that $200, you get enterprise licensing for vCenter and ESXi, not to mention basically most of VMware's software library, from VDI with Horizon down to VMware Workstation. If you're interested in home labbing and building your enterprise virtualization skills, it's an absolute must have. This just leaves us with the two little bubbles below my TrueNAS scale system and my Frankincense PFSense firewall, both of which offer some services. Starting with Scale. Obviously, outside of the storage functionality, Scale also runs containers, but to be honest, I really don't take advantage of that since I already have a functionally deployed container VM. I do, however, run a storage node in a container on Scale, also run net data to keep track of the real-time ins and outs of Scale, ZFS, and the like, and because I can, Portainer. On the PFSense side, it's functionally running security and security-adjacent services. Outside of being a world-class firewall, I run PFBlockerNG to filter DNS and to block IPs based on geolocation. I'm currently evaluating TailScale as a means to replace OpenVPN, which is still functional. And lastly, I have dedicated site-to-site -site VPN tunnels between John's place and my place, and Brandon's place and my place via good old-fashioned IPsec. And that is pretty much all there is to it. If there's anything I touched on here that you'd like a dedicated video about, let me know in the comments below or better yet, on our Discord. It's free and full of people who are passionate about self-hosting and home labbing. In fact, I owe a special thank you to our Discord member Gregarious Dude for recommending that I make this video. One last thing to note, home lab is what you make of it and I'd love to hear what you run in your home lab and what you self-host. So hop on over to our Discord and share it with me. And finally, thank you to our YouTube members. You guys help keep the lights on and we thank you for it. If you'd like to support what we do here, consider becoming a member or buy some of our awesome swag. It all helps us keep making these videos. And now that you finished watching this video, how about checking out this place over here of other great home lab and virtualization videos we've done in the past. If you're looking for your next great inspiration for home lab, we can help you find it.